Hello Thrill Seekers! And there'll probably be two intros to this video because I forgot to say something, which is that I put up a new podcast. So go to my Hardcore Zen podcast, which is wherever podcasts are, are podcasted. You can find it. It's called the Hardcore Zen Podcast, and I wanted to let you know. Uh, I was off for a few weeks because things got too busy, but I'm doing the podcasts again, so the podcast is up there for y'all to listen to. So now, take it away. Uh, the other video that I already did. Hiya folks! I got a question a couple of days ago from somebody and it was a kind of the standard question I get a lot about am I doing Zazen wrong and how should I do it? And I've addressed that before but this one brought up something that also comes up fairly frequently, which is, the, it wasn't the main point of the question, but part of the question was about whether he, as a Westerner, could possibly ever understand Buddhism or do Buddhism or do Buddhist practice. And this is a question that comes up a lot, and I've probably addressed it on this page before, or on this channel before, but I want to address it again. One of my favorite versions of this I brought up in a couple of my books, and one of them is in Letters to a Z, Letters to a Dead Friend about Zen. Sorry, getting the title wrong. It's on page 76. And this is kind of my go-to version of this question that I think kind of gets, gets right to the heart of what the question really is. And here's what I wrote about it in the, this book. Uh, on page 168 of the book Zig Zag Zen, uh, Charles Tart, who is a uh, listed as an author of several books on transpersonal psychology and parapsychology, and he says, Meditation was far more difficult than I imagined, and a lot of meditating was spent daydreaming, rebuking myself for daydreaming, and getting nowhere. It's clear that many of us Westerners have such hyperactive minds and complex psychological dynamics that it is very difficult to quiet and discipline our minds enough to make any real progress along the meditative path. <sighs> now, this has got to be the most egregious version of this question because this is sort of, um, I guess the kids call it a humble brag uh, when he says... Uh, we Westerners have such hyperactive minds and complex psych psychological dynamics. In the other, I don't remember which other book I brought this quote up in, but in that book I found some quotes from uh, earlier centuries about Western people talking about uh, Easterners. And they were they were talking about their simple minds and, and things like this, you know, saying that they had simpler minds because, I don't know, dull, simple minds. Hey folks, as I was editing this video, I found the place where I, found, where I put that, and it's in another book of mine called There Is No God and He Is Always With You. It's on page 30, and what I wrote there is the idea that there is any difference between the Eastern mind and the Western mind in terms of the difficulty of meditation is a pervasive fantasy that contemporary Westerners use as an excuse to drop their meditation practice and look for something easier. In the Victorian era, certain European and American people liked to talk about the Oriental mind, in quotes. The Oriental mind was said to lack intellectual ability to be, and here's a quote, low, tame, and undecided, with few strong lights and shades in it. That's the end of the quote, according to a man named John Davy, who studied Asian cultures in the 19th century. So that's, that's what I was talking about. Now back to me. So it's kind of a, it's, it's racism, basically. It's this idea that the, the people in the East have these dull, simple minds that can easily do meditation, but we in the West are, are so complex with our psychological dynamics that we can't do it. Well, it's nonsense. Everybody's uh, complex, everybody's, uh, what, what does he call it, psychological dynamics? Yeah. Are, are the same degree of complexity and everybody has a hard time with meditating and everybody goes through this process of daydreaming, rebuking themselves for daydreaming and blah blah blah. And everybody feels like they have hyperactive minds. There is a possibility that we have 
got more hyperactive minds these days because we're used to so many distractions. Uh, a, a good friend of mine just got on TikTok, and I followed him on um, on uh, uh, what's it called Instagram, and I looked at some of his TikTok videos, and I'm going, oh, this TikTok video, this is like this is like for people with really short attention spans. You know, you just get like a blip of, of everything, and nothing gets into any depth. You know, so we're we're kind of used to that and everything in entertainment seems to be going faster and faster and faster to where people have no patience for anything so yeah i think maybe we've lost a certain amount of patience but that goes for our sorry ziggy's uh, oh ziggy's playing with my mother-in-law uh that goes for our entire species you know i don't I, there might be a few people out in the you know very remote areas who are not yet touched by this uh, kind of hyperactivity and hyper fastness and that might make it a little bit more difficult for us than for people of the distant past although i kind of even doubt that because i i think what's required in meditation is certainly a certain degree of patience is is required and if you're an impatient person you're going to have a harder time than a patient person sorry i got distracted by the dog and and turned it off for a second so uh, so patience might be an issue and it might be a cultural issue but i'll i'll tell you a little bit about the the people of the east you know which which seems weird i seem like one of those idiots who talks about this but i i realize that i have a kind of unique uh, position in all of this in that I don't know if I'm uh, the only one but when I hear about people who went to Japan or perhaps Korea or Vietnam or somewhere else to study Buddhism what usually happens is that person doesn't just go to Japan let's pick Japan for example they they go to a monastery in Japan and they live in that monastery and they have that experience and I and I think that's a, a really admirable thing to do I didn't do that I never lived in a monastic situation in Japan but what I did do is I spent 11 years working in Japan in a company that was probably the most Japanese Japanese company you could find. I didn't I don't mean that they were an example of the stereotypes one sees in movies and such like about uh, Japanese workplaces. But what, what I mean is that uh, Ultraman is sort of Japan's equivalent of I don't know Mickey Mouse or Superman or you know one of these iconoclastic icon no that's not the word not iconoclastic one of those these characters that's a cultural icon that's what I mean you know so so that you when when you think of Mickey Mouse you think of America and and people who know Ultraman that's that's Japan Ultraman almost represents Japan for a lot of people uh, in Asia and for a lot of people in Japan so I worked for this company that that made the Japanese cultural icon you know maybe not the only one you know I used to go at hello kitty and uh, i don't know pokemon and all those other ones but uh, but one of the big japanese cultural icons so i was really really steeped in japan and the only other person i know who is both a, a zen teacher and truly sort of steeped in japan would be muho who uh, used to run antaiji and then he retired from antaiji which is a zen temple in japan but he's also very very steeped in the culture most of the other people and of course there are probably people i don't know about kind of go in there and they get steeped in the maybe the monastic culture of japan but not in the overall culture of japan or china or wherever they choose to go so just kind of observing it on the ground my feeling is that the average japanese person is no more able to successfully and i hate that word successfully successfully meditate or do zazen than any western person and and by successful i mean the way we measure you know success is you know having this clear mind or whatever which is not really success and i've talked about that a lot but meditate if we're doing zazen is doing zazen whether you are successful at it or not you're still doing it that's an important point to make but the idea that that uh, 
a person because of the virtue of being of a certain race and born in a certain country is going to be better at meditating than you are and that you are at a disadvantage if you do not happen to be of that race and of that birth it's just not it's just not true the only difference is possibly a kind of the way things sort of seep into cultures. So, for example, one of the things I noticed when I was living in Japan is that I'm not a Christian, and I was raised without much religion in our, in our household. I say this all the time, but our, our household was nominally Protestant, but you know, nobody ever went to church or anything. We were Protestant because we weren't Catholic or Jewish, but we didn't do any anything. Any, we didn't have any beliefs in anything that were that were um, you know in, indoctrinated. I wasn't indoctrinated into a belief system of Protestantism. However, even so, by virtue of the fact of growing up mainly in America, except for those four years or, or almost four years I spent in Africa in, as a child, uh, which is, I was in Kenya, which is also a Christian country. So by virtue of being raised in two Christian countries, I imbibed a lot of Christianity. So I know the basic story of Jesus and the nativity, that you know, the Christmas and Easter and everything else, and the basic sort of Christian values and um, Christian doctrine. Did I say that? You know, they're all kind of in there, whether I like it or not. And one of the weird things I noticed about myself is I, I don't, I'm not going to try to do this to demonstrate, but the last time I tried, I could recite the Lord's Prayer by heart, which makes no sense at all because I was never, I can't even remember ever reading the Lord's Prayer, but somehow <laughs> it's, it's stuck in, in my brain, it's in there. Uh, so that's just as a result of being raised in, in two Christian countries. So if you're raised in a country that's nominally Buddhist, you're going you're gonna to know a few things about Buddhism intellectually, and there are cultural values that, are, that come from Buddhism. For example, one uh, that comes to mind in Japan is bowing. Uh, the Japanese are famous for bowing. Even people in other Asian countries think that the Japanese are kind of crazy for bowing. Like they bow all the time. Much you know, you, You'll find people bowing, uh, Chinese people and Korean people and uh, other people in that area will bow sometimes but not as much as the Japanese and the bowing tradition comes from Buddhism it comes from the the temple practice of, of bowing so it became part of the culture but that doesn't mean they have an, an easier time meditating because they don't if you don't have any training people I knew in Japan as children everybody seemed to have a story of going being being taken to a temple and meditating but you know, once or twice, <laughs> you know, not, not as, not as a regular thing, you know, once or twice in their childhood, uh, they went to a Zen temple and they meditated for a little while. So they have a little bit of experience like that, but there's nothing intrinsic about being a Westerner that's going to make meditation any harder for you than it would have been if you were not a Westerner. The, the, the few, Japanese people who I knew who meditated regularly had a, has, who did zazen regularly had had as hard time with it as anybody else. So you know you're all in the same boat. So I just thought I'd make a little video about that. There's nothing. There's nothing to it. Here, here here's another example. If you are watching this video channel, the chances are you know more about Buddhism than the average Japanese person. I was constantly, when I was over there, answering questions about Buddhism from Japanese people who wanted to know, you know, and they knew that I studied it and they would ask me about it because they didn't know. They didn't know. Uh, they'd heard of Dogen, but they didn't know any of his philosophy, for example. They often didn't know the, the basics of the sutras and, and uh, even the life story of Buddha uh, was often uh, something I would get asked about. So, so there's not there's not really uh, any anything intrinsic in it. So, you know, just in case you have that question, I don't know how many people have that question anymore, but it seems to come up a lot. So there you go. There's my there's my answer for you. So if you want more weird answers like that, you can go to the URL you are seeing this on the screen below and make a donation. That is hard excuse me hardcore zen 
hardcorezen.info slash donate. That is hardcorezen.info slash donate. There you will find links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts. Those are my main means of support, and I really appreciate those of you who donate. But as always, this is offered for free, so you don't got to donate if you don't want to donate. So we will see you next time. Have a good time all the time. Bye. Hey, Ziggy. Ziggy, what are you eating? Are you eating something you found on the ground? Jeez, stop that. You're going to make yourself sick. No, don't eat that. Okay? Just don't eat that. I don't know what that is. I don't think that's good for you. How about I throw you your ball? What are you looking at? All right, we'll see you later, Ziggy.